Okay, so here's a very simple explanation of how the k-means clustering algorithm works. Now, I'm not the first one to come up with this. There are many good uh, slide shares on LinkedIn and other places uh, you can find that give very similar examples. Uh, but this one's a shortened version targeted for the purpose of my um, machine learning class. So here we go. Let's walk through k-means. So let's start with some background here. Here's our overview of, uh, of the high-level steps. Uh, the algorithm needs to begin by knowing or choosing a number of clusters. Now there's a variety of ways these can be choose, but it needs to be fixed ahead of time. Once the number of clusters is chosen, initial set of seeds or initial cluster centers for each of those K clusters is set. And once again, there's a number of different techniques for choosing where to put these seeds. Ultimately though, it's not going to matter because it's going to end up with the same cluster assignments. Putting the seeds in a better set of random places just simply means the algorithm will move quicker. So uh, now one thing that's often ignored is the role of theory in choosing the number of clusters uh, and the location of the seeds. So uh, a lot of times data analysts will, will tell you or analyze only what the data tells them. But if our data is not truly a good representation of the actual population, that we're interested in, then the data may not tell the whole story. And that's where theory is useful to explain, okay, uh, if we're trying to segment customers in a particular type of market, here's what prior research says about what segments there truly are. For example, uh, Weston has a classic privacy index where he describes uh, consumers based on the different types of privacy concerns they have. There's good theory to explain four different types of privacy fundamentalists and things like that. I would use that theory if I'm analyzing data or trying to come up with a cluster uh, analysis uh, to describe my customers in terms of what types of privacy concerns they have. Anyway, let's move on here. Uh, we're going to have a certain fixed threshold. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that. It's easier to show you. And then we compute uh, new cluster centers as we continue to assign cases or units to each of the nearest cluster seeds. Then we're going to repeat go back and forth repeatedly until uh, each time we recalculate cluster centers for each case or, or uh, distances of each case to the center of each cluster, uh, no more new cluster assignments are made. So uh, if you're a programmer, basically we've got this do while loop. We're going to repeatedly assign each case to the closest cluster center, uh, re-estimate the cluster centers, and then repeat until there's no more reassignments of data points to a cluster center. So let's take a look here. Here's our simple two-dimensional clustering uh, problem. Two-dimensional only because these cases here represented by my gray ellipses are represented over two dimensions, an X and a Y axis. Just imagine, imagine X, Y overlaid uh, over these data points. So we got to start by determining the number of clusters. We're going to say three. Now there are some techniques, like I said, you can use theory to tell you how many clusters there could be. Um, Tableau, for example, uses this formula to determine how many clusters there should be, which is basically uh, the total variance between cluster centers divided by the variance within clusters uh, multiplied out by this formula where n is the number of cases and k is the number of clusters. And they'll calculate this formula for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth number of clusters and determine which one comes up with the highest score based on this formula. And whichever number of clusters comes up with the highest score, they'll say, okay, therefore there should be two clusters or three clusters by default. So unless you have a theory to tell you exactly how many clusters there should be, let Tableau go ahead and use this formula to determine how many clusters there should be for you. And again, that's appropriate if you have no reason to suspect that the data you're analyzing is not a good representation of the entire population. If you're worried about your data, then then you could be hesitant and look for good theory to inform you how many clusters there should be. Anyway, all right, moving on. So here's our initial cluster assignment. The star represents the center of the cluster, and we simply picked three cases and said, let's assign this one to cluster blue, orange, green, and stick the center of the cluster in the middle of the case because there's only one case assigned so far to each cluster. The gray, the gray uh, ellipses are unassigned cases. So let's pick one. Here's the next case we want to assign. Now let's measure the distance of this case to each of the cluster centers. Um, technically, my arrow should point not to the ellipse, but to the star, because that's where the center of the cl cluster is. But it's pretty easy to tell, regardless here, that this case is closest to orange, so 
let's assign that case to the orange cluster. All right, now in our do while loop, we got to reassign or recalculate the center of our orange cluster. It's no longer right over the middle of that cluster or of that case, it's in between these two cases. So cluster center has changed. Let's proceed with another case. So we pick the next one. Clearly still closest to orange, no problem. Assign it to orange, recalculate cluster center. Now we're right about here. Actually, I probably could have put that star a little bit further down because this middle guy is pulling the direction slightly uh, south there. But anyway, that's all right. I think you get the idea. So let's uh, continue with another case. Let's pick one up here next to green. Clearly that's a green. Uh, let's assign it, move the green cluster. Let's wash, rinse, repeat. Assign the next one. This moves the star closer to this guy, but it stays this direction a little bit because this center case is pulling it here to the west, so to speak. Let's grab another one. All right, still closest to green, but just barely, as you can see here. But it's still green, so we assign it. All right, let's move the cluster center. Keep going. This guy clearly closest to blue. Let's recalculate, a, let's skip ahead a few cases here. So we've assigned a few of these green guys, a few of these orange guys here, and another blue one. Let's take care of this case over here. Now, is it closer to green or blue? All right, it's barely closer to green. This line's just a little bit shorter, so we're going to assign that case to green. But let's skip ahead again. We've assigned these two to blue, several more greens, a few more oranges, and now that shifts these cluster centers just a bit. Let's recheck this guy over here that we assigned to green. Still closest to green? Not anymore. Our line here is now closer to blue. So that means we have to reassign the case. Here, as you can see, there's my measurements closer to blue. Reassign it now to blue, update the blue cluster center, update the green cluster center, which looks like I forgot to do that. I should have moved him a little bit further that way. But anyway, but that's the idea. As we go through and, and reiterate and continue to assign cases and continue to move these cluster centers, it may change the actual assignment of some of the cases. So what we need to do is go through and assign every case and then reevaluate each case once again to see if it's still as close to the cluster center as it used to be. And eventually, as we keep doing that, oops, uh, as we keep doing that, um, uh, eventually, as we loop through, there won't be any more changes. And after we've gone through two iterations of all the cases, and there are no changes to any of the cases, we're all done.